Now, when it comes to the revelation of the Quran, when it came, it didn't come all at once. It did not. The, it came piecemeal over a period of about 23 years. And the very first subject addressed in Quran is the worship of Allah, the belief in Allah and the worship of Him. Because, and stop and think of the logic, if it weren't for that, then what would be the advantage of presenting any kind of laws to the people if they said, well, I don't really believe in the source, so I'll just pick and choose. I'll take what I like. But, you know, if it goes against my logic or I don't like it, I'll disregard it. So the first thing is to believe in the source that it comes from. If you really believe there's a, a law, you know that there's God, and you want to do what he wants you to do, and then you come to the conclusion the Quran is really from him, then when you look at it, you have a different attitude. Because you say, well, even if I don't understand it, I'm going to try my best to do it. In each case, even in the structure of the grammar of the language throughout the Quran, we always find the subject of Allah first. Aminu wa amilu salihat. The belief, the correct iman, and the righteous deeds. This is how we find throughout the teachings of Islam. Belief first. I mention this because the rules that came to these people were pretty tough. And the ones who didn't want to believe would have rejected immediately because they said, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I got my own gods and my gods do what I want them to do. You know, you get a little god in a box or something and pull it out and say, now here's what I want you to do. You know, kind of like a magic genie. And this is what they're looking at. This is what many people, even today, when they... When they Think of their God, you know, part-time God, whatever. But, come on, God, I want you to help me win this uh, lottery. Or, come on, God, I, I, I want you to, you know, I want to roll lucky number seven. And that's when they're calling on their God. As soon as they get what they want, they go, wow! You know, they'll say, come on, God, help me, help me, God. And when they win, they go, yeah, man! Well, did you ever notice that? Why do they say man? I don't know, I'm just playing with words now. But I just, just hit me. What I'm saying is, when we get what we want, forget about God, I got what I want now. So, there weren't that many people who really believed in Muhammad in the beginning. There really weren't. In fact, they were in opposition to him. As soon as he opened his mouth and started talking about this idea, even though, look at this, he went from a high status. He was like the number one man for all of these people in his whole community in all of Mecca. He's number one because he never lied. So they knew, hey, if he says it, it's true. Number two, he never cheated. Good deal. Any trust he was ever given, he upheld his trust. And they used to call him the truthful. That was one of his nicknames. And another one that he was trustworthy, Alameen. And another one name that he had was the one who consoles or brings, uh, uh, rejoins the ties of kinship. You know, the one who is an advocate to bring the people together, smoothing things over, oh, come on, she didn't really mean it, come on, he didn't really, you know, come on, let's, you know, work things out. He was known for that. And these were nicknames that he had because he was really that high caliber of a character. He had never had a drink of alcohol, and as I already told you, these people were alcoholics all around him, but he never drank alcohol, not once. Never told a lie, not once. And he never had a girlfriend, never kissed anybody that was, you know, haram for him to kiss even kiss. He was invited to one party in his life and he was going to go with his friend because he'd been invited and you don't turn down invitations. You know, he said, come on, just go to the party. And Allah made him fall asleep and he never woke up to the next day. So he didn't go. If you understand this, I want you to see the kind of character that is standing there in front of them now and he says to them, if I told you that there was an army on the other side of this hill coming after us, what would you do? They said, well, we'd get ready. Now, he had called everybody out, so they thought maybe there really was something going on. So, are you saying somebody's back there? You know, do we need to get our swords? What do we need to do? And he said, so, you believe me? Yes, we believe anything you say. What's going on? And he said, then, I testify, ashadu la ilaha illallah. I testify, there's no God to worship except one God, Allah. And I testify that I'm his messenger to you. What? 
Now, why didn't they like it? Literally, the statement, La ilaha illallah. It means there isn't any God. There isn't any God except Allah. Now, they already knew there were plenty of gods. There's moon gods, sun gods, star gods, planet gods, uh, gods you can hold, gods you can see, gods you can't see, gods you can hear, gods you can smell, all kind of gods that they had. But they understood what he meant because in Arabic it gets really, really clear. Because Allah comes from the word Ilah, and Ilah is God. Like we have in English, we have G-O-D. In English, we have G-O-D, and that's God. And when you mean the big God, the, the God, you put big G-O-D. Well, that's Ilah. Either way you look at it, Ilah is still that same word. But when you say Allah, then they understand it even more clear because, and this is interesting when we talk about the role of women in Islam, the word Allah is not genderized. All the other words that we have, many, like house is genderized in Arabic, like it is in Spanish. But not the word Allah. It is not male, it's not female. Although in the Quran we find Hu Allahu, that means he, but it means it out of respect only, not out of gender, because Allah is not male or female. So they really understood that. The other thing is that it has no room for plural. In Arabic, Ilah, a god, Aliha, gods. In English, you put a z after something, it becomes plural. Arabic, you have to, you, you hear the Arabic, you know when something's plural. It's, there's no mistake, you know, like z at the end of something. No, it's like mosques, that's English, mosque, mosques, right? But in Arabic, masjid and masajid. So it's really clear. But there's no way to do that with the word Allah. You can't. So they knew exactly what he meant. That he's telling us the God of Abraham, because they were descendants of Ishmael from Abraham. They knew what he meant, and they knew that it was insulting to their gods, insulting to their beliefs, and they rejected that. And his followers for the first 13 years were subjected to some horrible tortures. And not just being having sanctions against them, not just some curses thrown at them here and there, but they were literally drug out into the desert. They were whipped, burned, raped, mutilated, assassinated. They killed them. They did a lot of things to them. The only thing holding them back from wiping them out altogether was the fact that they were from the various tribes. And according to the code of honor, if somebody from your tribe gets killed, you have to go kill people from the other tribe. And that's the only thing that was holding them back. It wasn't because of any real concern they had for the Muslims, other than one or two. Now, I've given you some general understanding so that you can kind of see how this develops. As I mentioned, the Quran, the revelation, it comes first to teach people to believe in God. Immediately after that, it starts talking about the relationship of people. And it puts limits. Because everybody's talking about rights. You want to know about rights, don't you? Rights. I want my rights. Women's rights. Children's rights. Rights for this and rights for that. Rights for animals. Rights for rocks even now. We're worried about minerals and water. Everybody wants rights. And I'm for that. I want mine too. What? What about limits? Have you ever heard anybody going out with a sign, a petition, you know, really? Limits, we want limits put on us that we can only eat so much. No, I don't think so. Limits on how much people can drink. Uh-uh, come on, you know, you don't see that. But this is what you see in the Quran. You have rights spelled out in the Quran, but you have the limits that go with it. So there's this balance from the one who created us in the first place. He makes it totally clear to you what your rights are, but also what the limits are.